Good evening, and thank you for joining us again as we continue our journey through the story of the Bible. To help us do this, we have been looking at the 17 time periods of the Bible, and this is not something that Ken and I have created, but it is something that we thought would be helpful and useful as we make our way through the story of the Bible. And as you can see, we're coming towards the end of this uh, study, uh, especially towards the end of the Old Testament. And next week, we'll be looking kind of in that awkward time between the Testaments. Uh, but tonight, we want to think about the return from captivity, specifically Babylonian captivity, and that's what will be our focus this evening. We have Ken joining us from Orlando. How are you doing tonight, Ken? Uh, doing good, Jonathan. Enjoying spending these uh, Monday nights together looking at the story of the Bible. Now, just a preview of next week. Uh, next week, we'll be looking at period number 14, where you and I will spend 20 minutes saying nothing. Right. <laughs> that's a that's a bad dad pre that's, slash it's, it's preacher joke. joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 400 years of silence and we will uh, summarize it to 20 minutes of silence. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I think what we'll actually see is it's a little bit of a misnomer uh, thinking about 400 years of silence. Uh, so I'll, we'll see what how you handle that next week. But I have a feeling we're going to look at some of Daniel a little bit next week as we think about those 400 years of silence. So the uh, people have gone into Babylonian captivity. God had told them they would go into captivity if they behaved uh, in certain ways, specifically the disobedience that he outlined in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and he has now brought that to fruition. You'll remember that uh, the northern kingdom of Israel goes to Assyria or into the Assyrian captivity in 722 B.C., and 112 years or so later, uh, the uh, uh, people of Judah go into Babylonian captivity. And so we'll just kind of begin rolling uh, through some of these thoughts. We talked last week, Ken pointed out uh, some passages in Jeremiah and Daniel that specified there would be 70 years of this captivity. Jeremiah is going to tell them, go ahead and build houses, get comfortable. Uh, you're going to be there a while. Uh, and Daniel chapter 9 at verse 2 is Daniel praying towards the end of that 70 years. He's thinking about uh, how the time has gone by and, and praying that God will begin to restore his people. And then in Zechariah, which is a, a post-captivity book, uh, prophet, uh, this 70 years is mentioned again. And one of the things that we see, uh, one of the purposes of this 70 years is it's, it sounds like a physical idea, uh, but it's really a spiritual idea. God says in a number of passages that the land will enjoy its Sabbaths. You see the people, that's one of the laws that they were breaking on a regular basis. They weren't keeping the Sabbath. Uh, the prophets are going to rebuke them for this. They don't seem to uh, change their behavior. And so while they're in captivity, the land can catch up on its Sabbaths, uh, if you will. And then we come to the end of this 70 years, and we get the famous decree of Cyrus, and uh, Ken, I'm going to put you on the spot just a little bit here. Why do I have Isaiah uh, chapter 40 down here? I think that should the next one should say 41 one. Uh, but why do I have Isaiah here? Well, as you know, and our audience knows, Isaiah was a prophet. Uh, and Isaiah prophesied um, of, of this period. Right. And what's great about this is he actually calls Cyrus by name some, what, 150 years or so mm -hmm. uh, before he ever would have even been born. And so Isaiah is already talking about how Cyrus is going to be a, a messianic type figure, a deliverer uh, for God's people. And then we have these two passages. Uh, you can read Second Chronicles, the end. This is the very end of Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 36, verses 22 and 23. And if you just turn over one more page, probably in your Bible, to Ezra 1, you realize that these are telling the exact same story, that the book of Chronicles ends with the captivity, and Ezra 
begins with the uh, beginning of the return from captivity. And you see what he says here in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah, whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem. And then not only do we have record of uh, this Cyrus decree in these two books, a reference or a prophecy about it in Isaiah, we have what is called the uh, Cyrus Cylinder. Uh, Ken and I don't have it. Uh, I'm assuming a museum has it. I didn't check to see exactly where it is, but this is the Cyrus Cylinder in which we find that he was allowing, they had a different thought about uh, world uh, dominance. Uh, they, they didn't believe in keeping everybody there captive. They believed in kind of keeping control over people in their own land. Uh, certainly, it would be better uh, for the economy uh, if that were going to be uh, the case. And so he actually sends a number of people uh, back to their promised lands or, or back to their homelands. And uh, we get this reference of uh, Yahweh telling him uh, to send the people of Israel back home. And so this is kind of just some secular historical evidence to, to back up what we see uh, in Scripture here. Ken, do you have any comments thus far? Um, well, just that, that it's interesting, two things. Um, one is, you're right, is the, the archaeological discovery of this cylinder that completely lines up with the story uh, of the scripture. And just a reminder that the Assyrians who took the northern tribes of Israel into captivity were overtaken by the Babylonians, who then took the southern tribes uh, into captivity. And now the Babylonians have been overtaken by the Persians or the Medo-Persians, uh, who have undone the captivity right. of, of the Babylonians. And so we see what's being carried out on the world stage uh, affecting God's people in, in those three empires or three dynasties. Right. Yeah, Ken, you, you really should have uh, told me that beforehand that I, I forgot to put a slide about the change of the world power. So that's on you. Uh, and no, you just wanted to hold it to this point so you would look good. Uh, yeah, you, you do have these world powers that are, are changing hands and the, uh, the Israelites seem to be the hot potato in the middle of all of this, uh, as, as you're right, the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians, and then next week we'll see the Greeks. And at the time that Isaiah, the, the prophecy that you mentioned earlier of Isaiah, uh, the time of Isaiah's writing, not only would Isaiah not have known the name Cyrus uh, without, of course, the inspiration of God, but he wouldn't even known that the Persians right. would, would have been in power uh, at, at that time. And so there's two levels, if you will, of, of, of a wow moment that, that right. Isaiah could, could make such a prediction. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, we want to think about the uh, post-captivity books of the Old Testament. Remember, our Old Testaments are not in chronological order. Uh, and so that ca maybe causes some issue, and maybe that's a good reason to learn these 17 time periods. That'll help you keep some things uh, in place rather than relying on canonical order here. And so as we return from captivity, I've already mentioned Ezra, and uh, he is that is where we begin to read of this return from captivity. And I know the book is named after him, uh, but he is not the main character at the first part of the book. The first main character that leads a group back to the promised land is going to be Zerubbabel, and that's in the year 538. He has a great name. It's a wonderful, powerful name. It's a shame we don't use this name anymore. Well, Ken, you know, we've been mentioning that 70 years. So where do we get that 70 years from? And this is what uh, we've mentioned, I think, the past two classes uh, of these deportations. They start in 605 when Nebuchadnezzar comes into Judah, 
Uh, and then an, about eight years or so later, these numbers are, are very inexact, especially the last two. Uh, it could be 597, 596, and 587, 586 uh, sometimes given there. But the 70 years is counted from that first year, uh, that first deportation of 605. Now, the temple's not destroyed until 586. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has had enough of these Judean rebels and comes in and mows everything down. Uh, but the 70 years really starts in that 605 deportation. And you see, you can count down that the decree of Cyrus, the return of Zerubbabel is in 538, which is roughly 70 years. There's there's not a, a an exact 70 years on the dot New Year's Day kind of thing, but you see that rough estimate of 70 years here. Uh, Jonathan, I agree that the 70 years are counted from the beginning of the Babylonian captivity at 605 to the return 580, 538, 536, somewhere in there. Uh, but what's interesting is if you were to count from the third deportation, basically the, the, the end of of the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. If you count it from 586, which you just mentioned would be the destruction of the temple, and you added 70 years to that, it would correspond very closely to the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, hmm. And so an argument could be made that you could count the 70 years from temple destruction to temple rebuild. Although I, I think you're right, a greater argument can be made from counting from the 605. But either way, 70 years, approximate 70 years lines up both both ways. So. Well, that's what we have next on our slide. But I've, I've taken the those dates off. And so, yeah, Zerubbabel comes in with this first group. And his main contribution is rebuilding the temple. That's going to be the job that we read about in the first part of Ezra. Uh, the book of Ezra, uh, it's a wonderful book, but the timeline is difficult to follow in Ezra. Uh, they, he jumps ahead some as he deals with some of the... Um, trouble that they have, some of the uh, confrontations that they have in the land, a uh, number of letters sent back and forth to Babylon. Uh, so the timeline's a little bit difficult, but this seems to be what's going on uh, in the main time as a rubble wolf with his focus. Then we get to the main character, uh, or at least the, the namesake of the book, and that is Ezra. And he actually comes in a good bit later. Ken, this is something that I often forget. I kind of uh, think, you know, boom, 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 uh, when it comes to the, the return. You know, the, the deportations happen roughly eight years or so apart. Uh, well, there's a little bit more time uh, between these. Ezra comes 80 years uh, after Zerubbabel. And Ezra is going to be dealing with some spiritual issues. Uh, 80 years is enough. Remember, that's longer than they were in captivity. Uh, and so you have a, a whole uh, lifetime uh, of people that have passed away now, uh, and maybe they're already getting back into some old habits, some, some poor routines. Uh, we know that idolatry is not going to be a problem, uh, but they are going to have some other issues. And Ezra is going to help deal with those issues. And then we have the book of Nehemiah, the man named Nehemiah, who was a cupbearer to the king. Uh, in Babylon, in Medo-Persia, uh, which is just fascinating to me that we have all of these godly men, these prophets, these godly leaders are always right where the king is. You have Joseph next to Pharaoh, you have Daniel next to Nebuchadnezzar, and now you have Nehemiah next to, um, oh, I just lost his name, just jumped right out of my head, uh, but the ruler at this time. Uh, Darius. Darius, thank you. It just jumped right out of my head. Um, and Nehemiah's main focus when he uh, goes to Judah, he had heard that the city was in shambles, uh, that the city was in ruins. And so his focus is going to be on rebuilding the walls. Uh, and boy, he gets it done quickly. Uh, and I love the phrase, Ken, I guess, do, do all of us preachers have a sermon? that they had a mind to work. Uh, you know, you got to have that. So are you even a preacher if you haven't done that sermon? Uh, 
Uh, and so you have uh, Nehemiah and Ezra overlapping somewhat uh, and and uh, the, the work that they're going to do together. I don't want to leave the impression that Ezra wasn't you know, a leader of the people or that Nehemiah didn't have anything to do with the spiritual situation. Uh, but these are just kind of some of their main focuses uh, in this uh, section. Did you have something, Kim? Well, yeah, I just, and maybe jumping ahead of you here, I don't know that it's anything other than just sheer coincidence that the captivity took place in three stages and the return seems to take place in three yeah. stages. It may be just sheer coincidence, but but I was thinking you mentioned the the distance of time between these returns, which is very striking. Maybe you talked about sermons in, in Nehemiah's statement there. There may be a sermon there. You would think these people would be so anxious yeah. to get back that they would all have come within at least a year mm -hmm. uh, of that. But it, it may speak of the idea of 70 years of captivity of, of how comfortable they could have gotten being away from home. Right. Um, and there may be a post COVID lockdown sermon in there that we missed That's uh, true. That, that, that how quickly we can redevelop new habits and forget about home. Right. Uh, so there's, there's one character, Ken, uh, that I don't have in this, uh, PowerPoint today that that we probably should at least mention, and it falls right into what you're saying, and that is Esther uh, and her story as as she and Mordecai, uh, her he winds up being her guardian, kind of not her father, but her guardian, uh, and that winds up taking place, uh, and and uh, you know them not going back home to the promised land, them staying uh, in Babylon in that area. Uh, fascinating story there. We, we won't get into it because it, it doesn't move the timeline of the biblical story. It's part of it, uh, but it doesn't keep us rolling here. And you're an obvious chauvinist that you're going to mention the men and leave the That's right. one you're right. woman you're right. out of, the, out of right. your PowerPoint there. <laughs> That's true. Um, did we mention Ruth when we came across uh, the judges? Uh, I'm sure I did, but I don't see, remember. See, that was your that was your lesson, and I don't know if we mentioned Ruth at all. Uh, just to throw this in there to help you, if you're trying to uh, uh, mentally organize where all this information is, it was during Zerubbabel's work somewhere during this time that the prophets Haggai and Zechariah uh, worked, and uh, you couldn't have two more different prophets. <laughs> As Haggai comes in and is verbally slapping people, trying to get them to wake up and focus on spiritual things. And then Zechariah comes in with some weird pictures and some weird thoughts and some weird saying, very much apocalyptic uh, literature. Maybe we can talk about that at a different time. I might talk about that some next week. Uh, but we, we have these two prophets. And then during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, towards the end of that, we have the last book of the Old Testament, and that is Malachi, as the people really have kind of uh, given up on being spiritually focused. And Malachi is going to come in and deal with that issue. And that brings us to the end of what we call the Old Testament. Uh, the people are back in their promised land. Uh, they are working. They are struggling with some of the things they've always struggled with. Uh, people don't change, do they, Ken? Oh, that's why so many sermons, you talked about sermons from uh, the statement, really the whole book of Nehemiah, how many sermons have come out of the uh, apathy of right. uh, the Malachi's day. Right. Uh, because again, people, you said you don't change. We've, we've cast off the shackles of idolatry but we've kind of fallen into just apathy and a eh attitude toward God, um, like those in Malachi's day, maybe. Right. So if you're reading ahead or thinking ahead a little bit, you see an issue, I think, as you look at Nehemiah here around, uh, pl please bear with us on these dates as, you know, we're trying to get these rough estimates in, but you have Nehemiah somewhere around 444 B.C., well, if you know, if I'm saying that this is the end of the Old Testament, you know that uh, Jesus is not born till uh, what four or six BC, 
which kind of renders the phrase BC a little null and void, I believe. Uh, we, and that could be some of the reason for the changing to common era and before the common era. Uh, so you know that there's over 400 years that our Old Testaments don't cover before, let's say, Luke and Matthew open. Uh, and so that's what we'll talk about next week. We are not left to guess about what happened during that time, and uh, we look forward to Ken walking us through that uh, next week. Ken, you got anything else before we close it out this evening? No, other than, like we said, the, the lining up of, of the so many lessons from the Old Testament. Uh, before we leave the Old Testament, you know, it's very easy to read through here and point the accusatory finger at the Israelites uh, but remember, they were, weren't written so we could pick on them. Mm -hmm. uh, they were written, as Paul would say, as admonitions for us, lessons for us. And so uh, let's learn the lessons from that. And then also, I would encourage our viewers, you talked about the difficulty of the canonical list of the books, uh, to, to maybe invest in a chronological Bible or mm -hmm. some kind of chart that puts the prophets chronologically in with the historical narrative, uh, that would help. In fact, that'd be a good chart to, to stick in your Bible somewhere, right. mm -hmm. uh, is that where those prophets line up in, in the timeline would be very beneficial in your, in your Bible study. Absolutely. So uh, maybe uh, some things to do this week as we prepare for next week, uh, thinking about how this Old Testament story is going to now move into the New Testament story. It's not a different story. Story. Uh, it's the same one, uh, and we'll continue. We'll see how they connect maybe next week, and then we'll begin looking at the New Testament side of things. We are glad that you joined us, and we will look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>